Hello, and welcome to part two of our series of lectures on the urinary system. And in part two of the series, we're going to start looking at the nephron, we'll basically start looking at the functional subunit within uh, the kidneys. So as I said, the, the nephron is going to be the functional subunit of the kidney. And so if we take a look at this uh, kind of simple diagram uh, associated with this, uh, what we can see is that the nephron is going to be composed of a renal corpuscle, and the renal corpuscle is essentially the blood filtering unit. And so what we're going to have is essentially a, a very rich capillary bed, which is going to be a surrounded by a structure, which is going to allow us to collect the filtrate, collect the materials that have been filtered out of the cardiovascular system and collected into this system. So they've got the renal corpuscle as a filtering unit, and we're also going to have a uriniferous tubule, which is going to be involved with modifying and processing this raw filtrate into a more mature urine, into the, a urine more similar to what's going to be excreted from the body. And so renal corpuscle as the filtering unit, uriniferous tubule is going to be involved with processing uh, the raw filtrate. And uriniferous tubule is going to be composed of a proximal convoluted tubule, a loop of Henle, and a distal convoluted tubule. And so if we take a look at this, proximal and distal are going to be in relationship to how close or how distant they are from the actual renal corpuscles, the start of this mechanism. So basically the proximal convoluted tubules are going to be the convoluted or twisted tubules. They're going to be relatively close to the start of this mechanism. The materials that are going to drain into the loop of Henle the descending loop of Henle, and then the ascending loop of Henle, and then go back into a distal convoluted tubule. Now keep in mind that this distal convoluted tubule, convoluted for twisted tubule, distal because the urine, the materials within this, have flown, have uh, gone through a long series throughout this duct system, this tubule system. This distal convoluted tubule may twist around and will twist around and come into very close proximity with the renal corpuscle itself, and we'll talk about some specialized structures associated with it. So it's close to it in kind of anatomical proximity, but it's distant in the amount of distance that the urine has flowed as it's being processed within this uriniferal tubule system. Ultimately, this nephron, this distal convoluted tubule, is going to dump into the collected tubules and collected ducts that are part of the medullary rays that we talked about in the previous lecture series. We take a look at this again. The overall function of the nephron is going to be filtering when we're dealing with the glomerulus. And so essentially, if we take a look at the top, we're going to have blood coming in into one arterial, going into the glomerular capillary beds, and then it's going to have a second arterial. So we're going to have an afferent arterial coming in, an efferent arterial going out, but the blood is going to flow through the capillaries and materials are going to be filtered out of it. Now, the things that aren't filtered out are going to go through that efferent arterial and then go down through a second capillary bed, and the second capillary bed is going to be the paratubular capillaries. If we take a look at the filtrate, that filtrate is essentially going to go into Bowman's capsule, which is going to be a, a structure, an extension of that uriniferous tubule, which surrounds and supports the glomerular capillaries, and then what's going to happen as those materials are passing through this urinary uh, tubule, what's going to happen is we're going to reabsorb some things, we're going to secrete some things, so we're going to be modifying those materials. So the paratubular capillaries are going to be important because they're going to be transporting away the things that have been reabsorbed from the filtrate or delivering materials to the cells in that region that are going to be secreted. They're going to be actively pumping these materials into the urinary space, into what will be then excreted from the body. Now the renal corpuscles are going to be found and located throughout the cortex. Now a majority of them are going to be what are referred to as cortical nephrons. They're going to be located throughout the cortex uh, and have relatively short loops of Henle, descending and ascending limbs. So we can see that on the right hand side. Now a small proportion of the renal corpuscles and nephrons are going to be uh, associated with what are referred to as the juxtamedullary nephron, juxta for nearby medullar uh, medullary medulla. So they're going to be about 15% of the nephrons that are close to the medulla. And they're going to be characterized by uh, a very deep region 
of their loops of hand length. So they're going to be extending down very deep within the medulla, almost all the way to the tip of the medulla. And they're going to be important for establishing the medullary osmotic gradient, which is going to allow us to concentrate urine. And we're going to talk about that and talk about how this occurs as we go through this lecture series. Now the renal corpuscle is the blood filtering unit. And so it's going to be composed of the glomerulus. And so that's going to be that rich capillary bed that we're talking about covered by Bowman's capsule, covered by an epithelial lining, which is going to both cover the capillaries itself, the glomerular capillaries, as well as line the urinary space uh, and collect the urine. Uh, but what we're going to initially focus in on is the filtering mechanism within the renal corpuscle. So we're going to be looking at the filtration barrier that's formed. So the glomerular capillaries are going to be a tuft or kind of cluster of fenestrated capillaries, and we've talked about those before. So fenestrated capillaries are leakier capillaries than in some of the other regions of the body. So you've got little pores that are present with relatively thin diaphragms uh, covering them. And this is going to allow for small materials to essentially be squeezed out of the cardiovascular system, out of the blood supply uh, going through these capillaries, and squeezed into that urinary space. In addition to uh, these ep epithelial cells, the endothelial cells, we're going to have some mesangial cells, which are smooth muscle cells, which are going to be found between the capillaries uh, and lying between these capillary loops. So we got an idea what the capillaries are going to be doing. The next thing we're going to look at are the Bowman's capsule region itself. Now, Bowman's capsule is a double-walled epithelial chamber. Basically means we got an inside wall and an outside wall. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that inside wall is going to be referred to as the visceral layer. And that's going to be the layer of epithelial cells that's going to be wrapping around the capillary cells, uh, the endothelial cells of the capillary. And these are going to be described as podocytes. Um, and the podocytes are going to have cytoplasmic processes that are going to go around, extend into pedicels. And pedicels are basically like foot processes. You can think about them as almost like finger-like processes. They're going to wrap around the capillaries. And in doing so, they're essentially going to help establish that filtration barrier by supporting the capillaries, but still allowing the space for materials to be squeezed out through uh, the gaps between these interdigitating foot processes, or you know, like the finger-like process, if you want to think about that. The outer region of Bowman's capsule is going to be referred to as the parietal wall. And essentially, instead of lining the capillaries, it's going to align that external region of Bowman's capsule and it's going to uh, delineate what's called the urinary space, but it's basically going to take that raw filtrate, collect it so it doesn't diffuse away, and direct it into the tubule system and the uriniferous tubules that we're talking about previously. So if we look at a scanning electron micrograph of this, and we're basically looking at this from the urinary space, we can see the podocytes that are wrapped around. So you can see these cytoplasmic processes that are wrapped around. Lots of these little extensions that are kind of interdigitated, almost like little fingers there, and so we've got gaps between them, which is going to allow materials that are passing through the capillaries, the glomerular capillaries, to be squeezed out through these gaps and get into the urinary space. But keep in mind that it's going to regulate the size of the materials that go through. And so blood cells are going to be able to kept, be kept within the glomerular capillaries, but small things like ions are going to be able to squeeze through. And so again, we've got the podocytes that we're looking at here wrapped around the capillaries, the glomerular capillaries, and the capillaries along the inside portion of these structures. We take a look at the filtration mechanism. Again, this is a, another artist's rendition of this. We've essentially got a barrier formed by the um, fenestrations within the endothelial cells, by those interdigitations of the podocells, podocells and the podocytes. So that basically we got some barrier there, but essentially particles uh, smaller than about 10 man nanometers, or smaller than about the size of albumin, about 69,000 uh, Daltons, aren't going to cross it easily. And so the pressure of the cardiovascular system pushing the blood and the fluids through these glomerular capillaries is going to put enough pressure that's going to squeeze out these small materials into the raw filtrate. And so it's going to enter into that urinary space and drain into the proximal convoluted tubules. Now the stuff that's left behind, the larger molecules, uh, the red blood cells, other cells within it, are going to be carried away by the efferent arterioles. But the efferent arterial, efferent for exiting, are going to be carrying away a very reduced volume of blood because a lot of the fluid 
has essentially been squeezed out into the urinary space and is going to drain into that proximal convoluted tubule. If we take a look at the renal corpuscle, again, we're going to have two directions associated with it. We're going to have the vascular pole, and the vascular pole is basically where the capillary bed is going to be attached to the afferent arterial, afferent for the arterial bringing the blood system or blood into that region. Blood is going to flow through the capillaries, things are going to be squeezed out through the filtration barrier, and then its blood is going to leave through the efferent exiting arterial. And so all of that is going to be entering and exiting at the vascular pole. At the opposite end is where the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be leaving Bowman's capsule. And so they're, they're basically at opposite, opposite ends of the structure. So we're going to bring blood into the capillaries, allow it to filter it, and then take the blood out from one end of the vascular pole. And then that raw filtrate is going to drain into the proximal convoluted tubule at the opposite end at the urinary pole. Now, looking at the start of the urinary tubules, we're going to see the proximal convoluted tubules, proximal again because it's close to that filtering portion, close to the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, convoluted because it's twisted around, are going to be lined by simple cuboidal or low columnar epithelial cells. So it's a nice example of a duct system. There's no clear demarcation between the cells because there's a lot of interdigitation between the cells, so we don't see a clear boundary between them. Uh, the cells are going to have a central nucleus, and they're going to be a little bit more eosinophilic than the distal uh, tubules that we're going to see later on. If we take a look at these guys with uh, electron microscopy, we're going to see that there are going to be a lot of my mitochondria within these cells. Again, mitochondria for production of energy, production of ATP, uh, but in this case, they need the ATP for pumping of ions. If we look at the luminal surface of the proximal convoluted tubules, we're going to see it has a rough appearance because of the presence of abundant microvilli. That microvilli, what are going to be referred to as a brush border, are there to increase the surface area, in this case for absorption. We're going to be pumping ions across this membrane. So we're going to be bringing materials in from that raw filtrate into the cells and essentially recycling or reclaiming materials that have been squeezed out into that raw filtrate that the body actually wants to maintain, that wants to keep in their body. So we're going to reclaim them and choose them and pull them back in from that raw filtrate that was squeezed out through that filtration barrier within the glomerular region. Within the proximal convoluted tubule, about 85% of the sodium is going to be reabsorbed. And so we're going to be looking at, again, ATP-driven uh, sodium pumps. Uh, they're going to be essentially pumping the, the sodium back into the body. Uh, water is going to follow passively, so anywhere from about 65 to 85 percent of the glomerular filter rate is going to be reabsorbed here uh, as it's following the salt that's pumped across it. We're going to do facilitated transport of things like glucose, amino acids, acetoacetate vitamins. Uh, so basically things that the body wants to reclaim are going to be actively or um, passively, in the case of water, brought back into the body, in essence, from that raw filtrate, from that urinary space, by the cells within the proximal convoluted tubule. At the same time, we're going to be actively secreting waste materials like ammonia and hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions, you can think about these as, as acids that are building up within the body, can be excreted or secreted into this filtrate. And so we're modifying the materials as it's passing through the urinary tubules. Now, the proximal tubule is going to be the longest and the most encountered type of tubule within the cortex. So it's going to be convoluted is going to be the, the twisted portion. So it's going to twist around in the region surrounding uh, our glomeruli, our capillaries. And then ultimately, it's going to go into a straight portion, which is going to be the beginning of the descending limb of the loop of Henle. And this is going to finish up our discussion, our, the first half uh, of our nephrons. And uh, as always, come back for part two to find out more about the loop of Henle uh, and the distal tubules as we continue to modify uh, the raw filtrate uh, within the urinary system. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks.